All right, my mum was uh, on a state wall and her parents before that she was living in Mor she was born and reared in Waterford uh, in Grange Terrace and it was her dad that was drowned on the conning bag but both her parents her dad and her mum were originally from Sleeve Row um, her mum was Roach from Curramore and married a neighbour James Ball from Loughnay that was on his side so um they were got married in the whatever year I suppose um, early nineteen hundreds or eighteen whichever one it was, and uh, the the grandparents now that my mum and that she had they there were seven in the family, and eventually mum was after being in America and came back to Ireland. I'll tell you the reason of that after. And she met up with Dad, who was then living in Waterford, but his people were originally here from Sleeve Row. His dad was living in Waterford and Mum at the time, and he was actually, after coming back out to Sleeve Row here, so they fell in love anyway. And after the couple of years, they got married, and the old homestead was here of theirs so they built this house a portion of this house we've extended since for themselves for married life in 1936. So you were meant to come here really right? Really really. <laughs> <laughs> it was on the cards. Uh, yes and um, I had a brother Paddy uh, who was killed off a roof here he was very well known in the parish and did an awful lot of um, work like social work and tops of the town tidy towns you name it and unfortunately he had an accident here nearly two years ago and fell killed instantly off the roof from one of the sheds down here and he was actually living over at the road here and a uh, little baby sister was after she just lived a couple of months she died never knew her even the youngest and I was actually born in the house, so I never <laughs> really came into it at all. So, um, yeah, we started then and uh, went on primary school here. Um, before that, though, why don't we tell the story about your grandfather, because that's a very interesting story. About the boats? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, he was a, a fireman on the conning bag which were the two boats which came out to have some be so famous later on uh, in Waterford for all the wrong reasons. Um, they were in the mercantile uh, marines in Waterford, the Clyde Shipping Company would have been their, uh, a, I suppose, employers arranging all the thing and all that for them. And um, there was another brother of his was William Wall, but he didn't go on the boats. He stayed, as we'd say, on dock. But my grandfather used to be on dock first. And on account of having a good family, big family, he uh, went to, thinking he was doing the right thing, went to the sea. And it was during the war years, December 1917. And they were, the two boats were, leave, after leaving Liverpool, to come back with a big number of uh, local Waterford, Waterford, Waterford area people on them. There was 40-something drowned off one boat. And there were nearly that amount again, 37 or 39 off the second boat. And um, he, they were... Uh, after crossing across, as I said, during the war years, and they were ready for coming back with whatever they had in cargo coming back. And uh, they, I think, had a bit of a meet up, the two boats, as they usually did before they left the port of Liverpool coming out. They'd have a couple of drinks, I think, the night before and say goodbye, see you on the mall, which we know is the Madden Waterford was the thing. But... Um, they were being watched anyway, and there was a storm blew up as the Formby was the first one to come. 
was the gun big my granddad was on. But a storm blew up and the Form B had to take shelter before it got out too far from Liverpool. So that was delaying it in time. And that was due in to Waterford, say, a day or two before the other one, the Conning Pig. So they, um, there was no news of it anyway, but what had happened as well was that the Conning Pig were supposed to wait until they got word that the Form B had got through. But seeing that the weather was so bad, it broke off all telecommunications and they never the word was probably sent but it never got there but anyway they came ahead to Warford uh, Captain Lumley was on that one and I think Captain Minard was on the farm bay so so far out into the they were chased by a submarine um, German U-2 boat U-62 it was I think and um that was always known of it. There was one hostess of the Formby. Her body was washed up on the Welsh coast. And only for that. Before, at that stage, it was the only thing that they got to say that there was. And, and it was a very, very big tragedy for Warford. So many people, the two boats, they used to be down at the waiting for news, waiting for the boats, waiting for all this before the picture back now, 1917 it was that and um, my mum we used to tell me, mum was 10 at the time and her older sister was 12 and she used to tell me like that they'd be down there waiting for the boats and up to the friary get a candle lit and in hope, you know, for that. So it went on anyway to finish out the family mums. She had, it, they ended up with their family. Uh, there were six of, th six of them alive when grandfather was drowned. And the last one of them was on the way. He was, the mountain granny was three months pregnant and he was born the following June. So it was really, really very hard on them. Oh, it's very sad. Yeah, very sad. But that's just my family. Yeah. Of all the rest of the families too. But I suppose we all, it's your own and you feel it and you're speaking for it, you know. So um, what age man was he? He was 43. And my grandmother was 36 at that stage. And, uh, so it must be tough on her after. It was terribly hard, terribly hard, like, you know, and although her own family, her, her brothers and that, were, her one brother was left at that stage in Ireland and he was out in Slavery out in Curramore. But in those days, that was a good bit away as well. You know, you had no transport, no nothing, of course. But she was a terrific woman, a marvellous woman. She lived on to be 1960, to die in 1961 at the year of 80. And she was a great, great friend of mine, great favourite of mine. And um, she was really, really very... She, she just got on with the job and yeah. that was it, you know. And... Um, there are some sisters of hers and a couple of brothers gone to America at the time. And in 1925, my mum would have been about 18 then, that they took mum and her older sister out. Mum actually finished her schooling in the Earthland Convent in Cleveland and um, gave them a bit of a start. My aunt stayed on, came home once or twice, but my mother came home. She was always had the hankering from home and always so worried about her own mother uh, being there on her own. So she came back in 1931 and um, was hoping that she was, which she was, of course, a big help to the mother at that stage after coming back. But... Right, my grandmother, she did so much for them, you know, in that time, um, she said, with hardly any means, because it took a while, there was a disaster fund set up in Warford 
for them because it took some time before any pension came through and the pension was very small then anyway and um the was very, other than that around that time the war was nearly finished of course but one of the things that she used to be doing she was very good with her hands and she was knitting socks for the soldiers in Waterford and that's the time lots of the women used to do that then you know but like she went on then and she just did everything for them and she uh, opened a hair dressing she didn't open the business but she helped one of the sons open his own hairdressing business and um, then there was another one went to serve his time and at that time you had to pay a fee for serving their time and that you know but she was well able to make all those provisions for them you know and then <clears throat> when, she, when she came back from america your mom mm. uh did she, did she talk much about america did she like it she she liked america she liked meeting the people and she liked that in it but i don't think she could actually give herself enough she was telling me a lot about it because there were two uncles there and three aunts at that time and they was they were very close and we're still in contact with some of their families as well here but um i'd say had it been different that she would have settled down there and would have loved the thing of traveling and all that but um, it just wasn't far her. so she came back to waterford then and she got a job and she was working in the um oh she finished school as well she did a spencerian college in america as well but when she came back then she got a job here and she was in the sweep office oh. in waterford and doing transferring the sweep the tickets and all that back from that. And where was the sweep office in what? Uh, as far as I know, it was some place near up on the cross there. I think near Garrigan's or some place along there. Oh, uh, uh, across from where the Savoy used to be. Yeah. Some place along, as far as I remember. And then you were born out here. I was born here, yeah. So what? They were married in nineteen thirty-six, and uh, my brother then Paddy was born in nineteen thirty-seven. So what's your early memories of Steve Rue? I suppose um, the usual going to school here and... Um, what was that went, like? Went to the primary school here. I enjoyed it. I was, I suppose, an outgoing person. And um, I was more or less, I, I'd say, kind of a carefree type of a person at that stage. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed going to the school, walk up to the school and all that. And... Uh, was interested in was one of the gang at the time like, and you know. I, I presume there was there was only a couple of classes was it? oh no we had uh, six seven classes oh, in the yeah so in the primary school, school. Yeah. it was yeah uh, it was up uh, from the shop there at Griffin's Corner up to the left there was the old school where we went to school and um, the usual, uh, we had two rooms with the smaller classes and then when you got to the older one, there were about four classes then in the bigger room after that, you know. And um, we were in for different things, the, the usual of schools and outside playing the different games and beddies and like that. What we well, used fire in the classroom? We did. We had a big great fire and the pupils would bring... Uh, some of the boys might be sent out at stage to go and get in sticks for the fibre to the room, especially the bigger room was so big and I suppose a lot of the firewood was wet. It was hard to have it good and warm and all that. We had a caretaker in the school at the time. Um, Mrs Morrissey was her name, some of her children and that are living around here all the time. And at, I suppose when we were in the early 50s I'd say they started a hot drink she used to make cocoa at lunchtime but that was terrific because it was a widespread school and a lot of them children had to walk maybe with clothes and everything a good bit a couple of miles in the morning in and home the same in the evening no cars then might get a lift like with uh, somebody going to the creamery some of them would and that for us now that was different we were able to walk up and that you know and then i suppose they got into the stage of bicycles and that and and tell us what the games you were saying outside you we used to play skipping and what we used to call beddies at the time it was um one hopscotch it came to be afterwards in later time and that you know 
And it was a great treat for us while we were in school. We used to do what we call drill as well. Um, love of she's, love of sous, and all this thing with it, you know. And uh, our teacher, at the main teacher, I suppose, at that time, the master, was Mr Carey. And he lived a few miles away over Kilmacow Parish. And we had another teacher who used to come out from Waterford, uh, Miss Dane. Um, she would be an aunt of Desmanahan's. And we had a Mrs. Morrissey, various teachers, but the, then Mrs. Morrissey was the one, I suppose, from Ferrybank. He was teaching the junior rooms as well. I liked, I was very keen on Irish, the maths, um, reading, anything that we had, like at the time, uh, we used to do knitting, of course, and I suppose the thing that was wouldn't be have heard of nowadays for knitting. We were doing making socks and the thing we graduated from the knitting maybe a scarf to the socks, which was very intricate, turning the heel. So that was on four needles that we were doing that one. So if you could master that, you were doing very well. And uh, of course the nibs uh, who are your friends that uh, my one friend lives just down here close to me, Alice Hartley is her name. And um, we did go to school, did an awful lot together, like, you know, at that stage. And uh, the other friends we had, um, Betty Marr uh, was another one of mine, especially in the tech we uh, went together. We had uh, Sally Atkins from Nicholas Town. We had Kitty, uh, Kitty Larrissey from over the same area, area Bidverk or... Um, Maura, poor Maura Welch, who passed away there just about a month ago. And um, there were about the, nearly as many boys, I suppose, in the class as well, on account of being mixed schools yeah. at that, you know. And you know, when you were small, where did you like to go? You know what I mean? If you weren't, if you weren't in school, where would you like to go? Oh, we used to go for walks and maybe down around the bog. Well, at that stage, you see, uh, here we had no water as well. So we were kind of kept busy enough uh, because the thing would be to get um, a sweet can maybe in the evenings and we used to have to go down to the well, which was downstream from here. And um, Mum and myself would take off down. She'd have the bucket go and the can to fill it into it and bring back a sweet can. All that kind of thing, you know, and um, a lot of making hay and like that going on then at the uh, various the electricity. times. Electricity, when did that come? Electricity didn't come until the early, early to mid 50s. Oh, wow. It came, I suppose, here in the village part first, and um, before that, you're into the thing of cooking maybe on the um, stove or that, and the lights. Um, that you had to eye lamps and candles and that for that. I remember all the like of that going on, you know. And what was the big shock when electricity came? It was, it seemed so bright, so bright. But there were a lot, of, my father was very handy with a lot of those things. He was, had a, he was a small farmer, but besides that, he was very interested in a lot of that. And Ned Cavanagh of an uncle of Morris Cavanagh's and them in Marsford now, and knew that well. And uh, he came out here to start the electricity uh, wearing up. And I remember, well, it was this room here for all the world that he put in one plug and one light and said to him, now, Dick, follow on from that yourself. So... Up to that, like, we used to be trying to keep fires. There were fireplaces in our rooms. There were four rooms originally here. And to keep the house aired and warm and all the like that for us. But I remember one of the first things that was bought in electricity, in the electric, was an electric fire with a long, long cable that was able to be plugged in here and brought around to each room maybe before we go to bed or that and then I just warm up the rooms and that you know and uh, it sure was marvellous like to have it and to get it and I suppose especially for mum and dad who had been originally used to electricity in the cities and then come out here with no electricity and that you know so um, 
Yeah, that was much the way it was. Mm. My father, um, he was, as I said, a small farm, farm, nearly 30 something acres. And to make the living and keep things going, he used milk, have some cows. And um, he started a milk round, um, go for house to house, like Snow Cream did later on, and down round Ferry Bank, the pony and trap will be gone then. And eventually, when we got better off, well off, about 1949, we were after getting a car. At that stage, uh, around the time of my first communion, we had a car, and we'd be able to put the churn then one or two turns into the back of the car to go to the back seat and go and deliver to him. We were in heaven at that stage, but before that, when he'd be going, he'd go on the trap. But other than that, Paddy would have been after helping him up through the years and I'd be helping him going from door to door, measure out our milk. We'd know we'd have our customers and know what they'd want each day. As a matter of fact, it was, uh, there was a lot of work into it because in the summer, no fridges or anything in places, he had to deliver both the morning and the evening then and that and uh, then the winter once a day delivered and that so it was a very constant job because the, the milk wouldn't last it wouldn't that? last not of course our real, the real milk is you without any um, processing being done or pasteurised or anything like that on it you know fresh cow's milk and did you have then big stores in here for milk? Uh, over on the far side of the yard we had what we call the dairy okay. And um, worked up milk the cows, bring them in from the fields, milk them, and do that. Did you do cream and all that? Well? No, we didn't do any of that because um, that would be for when you wouldn't. We needed the milk as it was for supply. So we didn't do anything about going to the creamery or doing the cream at home ourselves either. But um, we used grow potatoes and um, turnips mainly, and um, we would sell some of them, bring them with us and sell them mm. along the way too and um, we used to have hens mm. egg, uh. eggs as well and we'd sell them so you well. were quite enterprising then oh we were yeah in our own way <laughs> we got going from that yes and uh, going around with the milk and all that when you were small would you remember a lot of the characters around that time I wouldn't so much remember the characters that were there in Ferrybank, but the houses and the people and made terrific friends with them. That was even now before the Rockingham houses were built. And um, right down to now, we would still meet some of the people. I remember, remember when you were coming around with the milk and all that kind of That's thing, awesome. like, you know, like that. So that was the way we reared up from that and then you went to the tech is that when you were 12 or 13 I, I would have been older than that we went first of all should I say when we were in the primary school we did we stayed on in seventh class we were uh, conf confirmation used to be only three years then and I was made my confirmation 1954 and um, our confirmation was in Ferrybank there were three years as I said amalgamated uh, with Ringville and Ferrybank itself and um, the bishop just come he was getting on in years then we were Austria of course and he'd only come every three years and then it went to two years and that after that you know but um, I remember some of the time we used to be entered into the fish so we used to have the fish down in the grounds in Belmont and I can well remember some of the girls were dancing, doing step dancing down there. And I was in it for Irish a couple of times um, that you had been out in the field. We seemed to have fine weather <laughs> then. And uh, an inspector or something at the different stands, different tables, and they'd exam examine you and have your chat there in Irish. And that so you, you were pretty fluent in the Irish? I was good in it at that stage. I couldn't say I am nowadays, but I, I was liked it and I was very good with it then at that, you know. And you didn't do any of the step dancing? I did a little bit of it, but... Um, Mostly just kind of going with the Irish and whatever else at the time, you know. And then you were saying about the old tech. The old tech, I started, the tech itself started in, it was here at, up at the hall. 
there is a room there at the side, at the right hand side of the hall. Now that's the new renovated hall uh, for the last couple of years, St Mary's, but it was on the premises of the old hall. And the, there was a great community uh, spirit around Sleeve Rio and the hall, the, when they started in the to build the take, there wasn't a secondary school around. And in 1951, that one was built. The, the, it started with one room there, which we call the Woodrock Room, which was built by voluntary labour. And at the far side of the hall, we had the use of the hall to go through the hall, and there were toilets and that in the hall. And to go through to the far side of it, out in, that'd be bringing it out into the priest's um, yard, as we'll say. There was a room there that they converted into a room for home economics, or the kitchen as they used to call it then at that stage. So when my brother and Seven started the first day in that in 1951, it graduated then that the domestic economy room started. And then um, in about 1953, there were a couple of other rooms built on. Uh, one at the back was for, uh, we used to call it science room, science, um, maths, English, you know, and that one. And at the back of that, there was a new cookery, um, the kitchen, as we used to call it then, there for that. That's it. Now I'll come forward then to my time there in about 1955, I'd say, around 55, 56. And where it had started with the one teacher, uh, Mr. Fior, Christy Fior from Waterford, was out doing the running it and, and doing the carpentry in that. There was, uh, it was, it wasn't amalgamated with Munkine, but Munkine was ahead of us. So there was a teacher sent down two days a week. This was now back again. I should go back to the 1951s. Two days a week to um, Sleeve Rio for however many pupils were there at that time. I'd say about 20, 25 in all. And um, Mr. Dorn has come down another two days. Padre Connolly was the one. He did Irish in those subjects and then Mr Doran came and he started on um, science and that there and then to come forward to around my time Sean Delaney came there in 1953 as appointed uh, as a science teacher science English Irish all those ones and we had a Miss Hearn doing the cookery there forest cookery sewing laundry all of that there and that and Christy Fior was still doing the mechanical drawing and that in his one. Oh, was he one of the Fiores? The he was, yes. The family went on to become architects and all that, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, there would be of those. Um, a son of his was Nicholas. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nicholas. There was a Nicholas and an Anne Fior. And then what did you do with after the tech? Uh, after the take, then, we we all got on very well in the take. They put us in for several different um, um, competitions and different things like that, you know. And after the take, then, I went to work in Waterford. I went into Breen's, Breen's at the Bridge at the time, the grocery, to the office there. And from that, I went on to star Tony Breen, was really my boss at the time, or Tony and Paddy and the different ones of a minute. And they were after buying the premises. Uh, there was the pawn shop up in Ballybrick and Sheedy's and they built the first supermarket there. There was a smaller supermarket downtown before, but Bisco supermarket, that's where it originated. So I was on the opening of the Bisco supermarket in... Um, 1961 I think 6061 60, and from that I was one of the team like I was in charge of the um, cash register and all that end of it and we went ahead then and we opened the one in Parnell Street Winston's best squad down there in the corner and at the car stand and um, I was on the opening of the one in Kilkenny for um supermarket there, Winston's were there as well and we opened the one in Limerick 
So it all fell into place all up to those years. And what was your role? I was uh, doing the office uh, between the money and the cashier and uh, keeping the registers in tow and the floats and all that for so those. you were good at the maths? I had the maths worked out all right, yeah. <laughs> Must have been anyway. <laughs> so um, I met Joe then, my husband, and in 1961, that was just after my grandmother dying at the time, and uh, he was working up the country at the time and he eventually came down to Waterford to start in Waterford in I think 1963 or 64 and he went into work then in Besco as storeman there so um, now where did you meet him? I met him in Tremor actually in the Atlantic Ballroom in Tremor my friend Alice and myself used my mum and dad used to bring us out to Tremor of a Sunday evening it was just an occasional thing and um, she wasn't actually with me the same night and uh, I, they used to have the early uh, dance there as well as the later dance and I met him at the their, the earlier dance so. and the earlier dance was that more for younger people or was it more no, for people it was, was yeah okay. it, that's what it was you know you could go to when people have earned too interested in staying out half the night yeah, yeah. I think it was something 8 to 10 o'clock or something like that was the first session is what yeah. they used to call it and you could get to train then, home or whatever uh, yeah but they used um, mum and dad used to kind of go for a walk and stay around for more they weren't chaperones or anything like that but it was just the way it was done at the yeah. time you know so we went there for a bit of entertainment music uh, at the he time. was down what was he down Tremorfa? Um he was working in Capaquin at that mm-hmm. stage. He was uh, he was he was a tree a lumberjack and he came on to that then and he was um, doing making hurleys and that and cutting timber for hurleys. So he came to Tremor and just happened. And he ended up then working in the store. He worked in the store. And did he continue to make hurleys after that? No, <laughs> he had enough to do with it. He did a bit like, but not not too much then after mm. that. Who used to make the Hurleys out in the uh, There was a man, Morrissey was his name, used to do some of the Hurleys there at that stage, but um, I suppose that would be really up to supply with yeah. that. It was really true, the Hurling Club, that they would have been doing those, you know, mm. different ones then from time. And about. And, uh, and you, what did you do then? You oh, hang on here now. Pioneer shows. Oh yes. Well, to go back to we have to go back a bit now. What? Um, should we say when we were in the tech in about the nineteen fifty five or that there was an adult class after starting there as well, and to even tell you now about the heating in the tech, I remember we used to go to some of the night classes there, and the teacher you used to have to turn on the rings of the cooker for to heat up the place for us. We won't give the name of the teacher <laughs> at the time, but to have it heated up for us. So there were different things. I used to go to a maths class there for a while in the night and uh, still young and uh, to a lot of those night classes. And uh, the next thing we started to do, we were being picked for Sive. John B. Keyes, Keane's Sive had just been released at the time. And Slavery were actually about the first place around to do the Sive. And uh, we produced it anyway, um, Christy Fiore and his wife. His wife was originally from, I think, Listowel area. And that's how she got the play in the beginning. And um, I took the part of the old woman in it. And uh, one of the other girls at the school did the young Sive in it. And um, then there were some, we were out from the school, there was another by in it, Gail Donovan. He uh, was Sive's lover. And um, then the others were adults in it. Michael Griffin was on the team there. Um, Philly Neil, Washi Murray, uh, Greta Irish and um, probably another couple of them that I'm forgetting oh, at this who stage. Dra- who directed it? Christy Fiore. Okay. Yeah, himself and the wife. 
And then from that, then you got involved in other shows. We it? did, yes, there. But even before that, what gave us a good grounding for dancing in that was when we were in the take, Sean Delaney at lunchtime used to bring us in uh, to the hall. Uh, completely voluntary as we'll say and he put on the gramophone and he used to teach us the Kaylee dancing so Kaylee's and all time walls isn't that so we really put a sleeve rule like on the map for the lack of those things and we used to go in then to the Arundel ballroom in Waterford they used to have a lot of the Kaylee not the Arundel the um Olympia. I'm sorry, the Arundel in Waterford. The Olympia used to do more of the modern dancing, but um, rough. Where, where was Arundel? Was it Arundel Square? Uh, yeah, roughly where the, the shopping centre is there now, roughly okay. there. And um, we used to, and a lot of come out from Waterford, Ferrybank area, to Slaverio here for the dance and, and for the, they used to have the boards going as well at that time, you know, and. Um, yeah, we got from that. So then we used to have a lot in the hall going on then. From the school, we had um, a fete, as we used to call it, at, in the summer. And there was a big thing, like um, we used to have a big fancy dress parade in it. And oh, it was great fun was up in the hall, in the fields. They were all parish fields at that stage. And people would dress up. And people would dress up, dress and parade down from the National School down to there. And we'd have swinging boats and uh, Wheel of Fortune and um, the other slit the, on the black and white to yeah. put in the money and all that onto that one. And the great community yeah. around always in it. And, and the, those fates, were they for charity? Or they were, they? yeah, for the fundraising for the church. And yeah. that then would be, was all coming on at that time for for that one mm. and even from the primary school we used to go in the um some of the choirs like you know for that and um we plain chant was the one that the school used to be in then so we had all got our uniforms for that and ringville school the same had theirs and that was taking place maybe once a year and uh, teachers and uh, if we were very lucky which a couple of times it happened this is my age now of it that we would be brought that evening maybe to Tremor for a treat and we had some photographs there and the old videos that were going on of uh, we out in the water just holding up the skirt and the shoes and socks off you know and this thing sure we thought we were delighted with ourselves doing that and um like, would you get to Tremor very often when you were small? Uh, we used to be, be lucky to do it because mum and dad loved going to Tremor and it was a break for them, I suppose. And uh, after having, when we had the car then, it used to be when they were finished with the milk and that yeah. and the Sunday evening was just a break someplace for them to go. And you mentioned playing chant. Yes. Could you explain the, what that is? The singing, uh, it, would, it would be hymns now and maybe some of the, we wouldn't exactly go into the higher class, the Gregorian chant, but this would be done now all around Austria, I'm sure other um, dioceses as well. And it was kind of more or less the same, a festival coming together of the primary schools of maybe fifth, sixth class around that. And we'd have a set certain set of hymns uh, to learn for it and the teacher um, conducting learning us teaching us all that and we had a priest director then from Kilkenny uh, years ago for well, it. What and makes plain chant different to the other singing? It was more on the like the hymns the like something more like the old hymns that we had there and that one you know um, maybe it could be Faith of Our Fathers or like there was ones where the Gregorian chant was more um highfalutin different tones and that into it but it, it was competitive as well we yeah. yeah yeah we would get a certificate or well the school would get yeah, it you know or that so and i have written down here desmond's garage what's that desmond's garage it was just up the road here where the lawnmower um people are there now at the moment and again desmond's garage it was a plot from our field here uh, field of ours, Dad sold him the plot, Tommy Desmond. The, we hadn't, that was again going back in the, I'd say, early 50s. 
and we slavery was just starting to kind of get on the market but then cars were starting to come and that so we didn't have any garage or petrol so the Tommy Desmond had been working elsewhere at the time and one thing went after another and he dad sold him the field the plot on the field and he started the garage from that actually the garage it was even built again with help from locals and um went ahead then to there was a bit of controversy in getting the petrol there in the beginning because um some of the suppliers wouldn't there was kind of a block on it that they didn't I suppose they didn't want to expand it too far and that so um they had a bit of trouble my father was a great instigator in getting it and um knew somebody that knew somebody and helped it out a lot. I think it was Caltex, I think was the first one that would give him the petrol there, you know. Mm. And uh, actually my brother Paddy spent about two year a couple of years there serving his time. And uh, another the, there at that stage, then um, Tommy Grant, who would be Catherine's father, around that time, he worked there for a while. He had finished uh, working inside. He was doing a bicycle repair and all that in Waterford. And what we it was just at the coming up before or around the time of the electricity. And for any matches or that, you would have to use the batteries for the radios. And Tommy, where he had been working in Halligan's and Waterford, used to do all the like of that, filling the batteries. You had wet batteries and dry batteries for it. So that was part of his job up there. You leave in the battery and he'd give you a little ticket and go back for it the next day or whenever it was charged. And uh, yeah. And Joey, we were talking about older people in the area that, you know, people that you might be able to remember. Is there anyone else that come to mind, characters that used to? Well, there was um, Nicky Cavanaugh, was his name, um, himself, and, say, Paddy Tyler. They, were, they used to uh, kind of take out the box and play the box and that at the college, you know, and do a bit of, bit of crack around and for the like of that. And then we had different people ourselves that um, maybe we'd go visit. I mean, in those days, you could get up on your bicycle and go a couple of miles around the parish and I had relations living over the way and call over on them and that, you know, and there was no... It was safe to do those things and you were allowed to do those yeah. things as well. They didn't all. worry about you. Yeah. yeah. And then, the, the, would, would there be house dances or what? Or? There were some house dances. Uh, there was... Um, I don't really remember the house dances now. That had been a bit before my time. But other than that, you had some of the platforms and um, there was one over... It used to be at the back of where the... Uh, well, the new the road, of course, is crossing it now there, but the creamery used to be over there and down from where the creamery was. There was a nice spot for the platform there. And, um, oh, would you remember that? I remember that one, all right. Uh, maybe if we had time for Sunday evening, we'd go over. But the big one from the area was um, down in Glenmore at the Scow Bridge. Well, halfway to Glen Glenmore just goes the Scow platform. And that one, they would travel on bicycles, that from a bigger area to it. Bigger area. Mm. But we also, like, um, even to go back, like, on the on the school one again, um, Mrs. Marno above was the caretaker in the school and that at that time. And her husband, Jimmy, was one of the ones that just provide some of the music for the platform there. And uh, one thing comes to mind... As you say about it, when we were uh, in the Take Betty Mar and myself, and of course some more at the time, uh, Clover Meats was going good at the time. And they came from Clover to ask, uh, they wanted, their, I'm not sure whether it was for the um, Patrick's Day parade in Waterford. I think it was a different festival. I think it was at the summer, just beyond the time in Waterford. But uh, it was an industrial parade. And I think their theme or their topic was, there was a globe, they made a globe that was made by some of the lads in Clover. And they came to know if some of us in the school, they came to teachers, of course, not to us, we were picked for it, uh, would go on the float 
but made the costumes and we were representing different we had a string coming down from Ireland for it, you know, from Waterford for it, representing I presume part of it was the different places that the exporting was being done to. And um sure this was a very, very big thing for us now, say fifteen years of age and that and that. So I remember um the Carrymore, anyway, Petey Sutton was driving the Clover, Carrymore, where all, it was all dicked up for it and it was on it and all that. And we were after winning the prize in it. So they did a lap of honour around Waterford, the three or the four winning ones when it was finished. And we came down, we came in and to come down Bunker Hill, which is now College Street, and as we turned the corner coming down there, the model started to shift a bit. <laughs> but uh, Petey being the good driver that he was, and I suppose he probably had a couple in the front directing and all, so he, there was no harm done, just shifted a bit. However, we held on for dear life, it, you know. So uh, that, was a, that was a big thing, like, at the time. I remember we were coming down and meeting some of our own people when we came back down, but the uh, Theatre Royal, they were, were taken off at then at that, you know. Mm. And did you get involved in shows and that yourself? We did. We did a good few of the shows now, uh, different shows at times, um, different other plays. I was more into the plays. Well, in the school now, even in the primary school, we'd put on concerts. There were always something going on in the hall, you know. And I remember one of the things now, uh, we were only about seven or eight and what we were doing, one part of it that we were doing was a comb band with a comb, oh, an ordinary comb, mm. and um, the music to the comb. Good. Mm, with that. Actually, who was going to our school for a while was Gilbert O'Sullivan. Uh, yeah, he was Raymond then, his sister Marion. Uh, their mother would have been originally from Sleeve Rio, and there was some change over then that they were, the time they were going to England, but he, Raymond and Marion spent some time in the school here oh. as well. But to continue then for the shows, as you said there about the Pioneer shows, the Pioneer were um, founded here, I'd say, about 1945. <coughs> and it went on then, and they used to go on outings, um, some of the favourite outings around at that stage had been maybe a trip to Glendalough and that. But of course, at them stages, <laughs> I wasn't doing that. But my mother and those ones would be going on it, you know. And it continued then after that. It kind of had a lull there for a while in the early 70s. I suppose times were changing. And it was revived in 1975. And... My brother Paddy, sure, he was so involved, like in the parish and everything, and he was uh, uh, made president at the time. And um, a year, I think, about a couple of years after that, then the father, the priest that was here at the time, Father Field, and we were in 1978, I'd say, had asked to do something kind of for the youth of the parish at the time. And um, a lot of the people got together and they, Paddy was the instigator of it. And they did, they went into the, there were the pioneer shows starting at the time, an All Ireland show. And the, the different, the teenagers of that time uh, would all, a lot of them now, different families, three and four, some of the families, and it was an outlet for them again. Yeah. And a lot of their moms now um, made the costumes and they got a great show together at that stage. And they went down to the different um, themes of the uh, thing there and they won the contest, they kept going, they put on the show here, there, and then they got to the quarter finals and the semi final and in the end I think it was in nineteen seventy seven that the final was in Minute and for a small parish of young people they won the All Ireland and it was a fabulous feeling around the place at the time and a great, great victory for them. 
So about two years then after that, in 1981, uh, things were going very well with the pioneers and that. And uh, Paddy worked in Clover Meats at that stage. And the usual, the few got together down there and a few around Sleeve Rio got together. And the ones that were in the pioneers then, and they um, ran two buses with over 100, 110, I think, were on it. And they got together and they went to England, from England on to France and Lourdes and um, had their stops along the way and came back direct from Sherbrooke, all right. But um, it was a great, it was a great thing, great victory. And a lot of people said that it really started. I wasn't on it. I was at home. Joe was on it, all right. And Paddy, his wife, Maureen, they had their children that on it. Uh, but um, it was a lot of people, apart from, from it being, a, what we say, a great parish event, it got a lot of people going. It was the first at the time that they started travelling a bit mm. and that they really... They were very thankful for it and mm. great experience. And w- what shows did you use? You were involved in theatre? Uh, well, only our own. We are doing some of the plays and some of the concerts and that here. What in was the name of the theatre company? Uh, we hadn't a name on it at that stage. Okay. <laughs> we just did. It was the adult education or adult whatever it was and we do the shows in it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that. And would you yes. ever perform in Watford? So. We did. We did a couple of the show, from the shows that we were in Theatre Royal there one time with it. And um, we went to Innistig. Um, we put it on Sive in Innistig. We put it on Sive in a few places now. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, well, listen, yeah, well, we want to get those pictures before we finish. Right. But I'm just wondering, is there anything else that we've left out? Well... Th- um, Anything that got to do with it or what about the older people, you're know, way back now, I'm talking about we say your mother is generation or your grandmother. Mm-hmm. Would you remember any of the old stories about, you know, like even the way people would have favourite saints and all those kind of things? The would like uh, some of the things like um they would have the thing of say at Easter now, that they would uh, bring the seeds to the church. And that that was done in my time as well, and for oh, holy yeah for Holy Saturday yeah okay. that was done in the morning at that stage, the Holy Saturday was in the morning then at that time. And then what would you do? With seeds, and we yeah. bring home to what you'd bring is a sample of the seeds, a portion of the seeds from what you were grown, and have them blessed, and you get the holy water as well coming home and sprinkle it on the different fields and in the cow shed, and same for Saint Bridget's crosses. St. Bridget's Cross, they were great uh, adoration and great respect for St. Bridget. And uh, that would be hang- hanging up in the cow shed to hopefully help keep away sickness and that, you know. Okay. Yeah. And so the- it was kind of like, I mean, I know nowadays it's easy to say these things looking back, but there was a strong element of superstition about it, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. in the sense of like, you know, like you were hoping to... Well, you were hoping... Well, I don't know if you call it superstition now or if you call it faith. Faith, okay. okay. It was more faith. Okay. The people did believe in mm. those things, you yeah, know, yeah. that it was right and that it was kind of going to happen. And, and the other thing about hanging out things for St. Bridget's Day? Was uh, that was done a bit... For, we used to do that here. We weren't really into that. That one now is more of um, a kind of... Um, maybe a pagan goddess, that end of it. But um, what we used to hang out here was to glorify the thing was a maybush. And you put, I suppose, the start of the fine weather and all that was the thing of that and different ribbons and strings and that on the maybush, oh. you know. Sometimes you'd still see them in places along the road. And what about, um, you know the other way, in the old days, again, people would have these beliefs in, like, the fairies and... Uh yeah, well, well, there was one time there now, and it wasn't all that. My one of my lads now, um, he's what he's forty eight, and himself and myself were here one night, and we happened to look out the window there, and up at the top of the field there, there was a fairy wrath, and we could definitely. He just nearly froze the same night. We could see the lights up there that night 
of the dancing around. And you see, the thing about that was they were after kind of going to bulldoze some of the field up there. And obviously there was that in it. And, yeah. So just, even though, I mean, you're the way we are now in 2017 and everything, there is a kind of underneath it all. There is a strong belief, isn't there? Oh, yes. So? Oh, yes. Very and much so. Nice with the fairy, yes. The oh, fairy yeah. Forts. Oh, yeah. I mean, that in this day, as we'd say now, uh, that was, in, he was, I suppose, what, in 70, whatever, and we could see the lights that night. I mean, for a young fellow like him, didn't know much about fairies, but I tell you, <laughs> Pierre stood and he said that night, you know, and he saw it. Yeah, right. there was yeah there was another thing then there about going in the from some of the time there going up the field here. Sometimes the the um, horses when they were going up the the uh, after some of the the war and after that the um, second war. Um, there were some of the soldiers supposed to have been killed around here and that it was supposed to have been uh, a lot about Cromwell and all that now it's Cromwell and time all around here and that the gloom when they were on the the soldiers were on the way to Ross there was a lot of the went on of the shooting and all the like of that pike and all in Ross but that the uh, there, there was supposed to be the story legend goes that a fog came down over the church and that the church was saved with that but we always heard that there were some of the soldiers supposed to have been shot up just up here from us but we had one horse in particular and a pony actually and any time we go to a spot going up the lane there, the one the back lanes there for that, this the pony wouldn't want to go any further and the cold sweat just come out through the pony. A real quiet animal. And we'd have to kind of take him down, get down off him before riding him and that and calm down and all these things. So obviously there was, something about that there spot. was something for that spot there as well. It's gas, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, is there anyone, anyone, any other characters that you want to mention before you finish? Anyone that comes to mind as people that you want to? Oh, actually, we had another fellow there, Morris Hennebury was his name, and some of his people actually were uh, lost their lives on the Conning Big boat too. He used to live down the way, and he was another character, and he was like the little drop and that thing, you know. But he'd always have some of the old tales for you and the old stories like and that, you know. When you'd meet him along the road, you'd say, well, here's Morris coming, you know. There was another fellow then over the graveyard there. We um, gave, Dad gave some of our land for the graveyard and they were building a wall there along it. And one of the priests at the time, Father Dial, this uh, fellow, he was Mason, so Ned, and he was, his name, go, Ned Welsh was his name, he just goes Ned the Mason. And in Father Died, I'm told this now, it wasn't, uh, Father Died went from here when I was very young, uh, but my father was telling me, and Father, he was doing such a good job on the wall, and building the wall and all that, and Father Died turned to him and he said one day, oh, no, Ned, he said, isn't it a wonder that you're so good at that, that you never built a house for yourself. And he turned to him and he said, Well, Father Dial, I'm surprised at a man like you to say the like of that. St. Joseph was a carpenter and he never built a house for the Blessed Mother. So that was the end of that one. <laughs> I'm sure the priest didn't pursue it any further. <laughs> so it'd be hard to put one on your father or two. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that so was he was it. obviously a good worker, your father. My father, yes, yeah. But the, who, the man that said this was the mason that was oh, building so the, the wall. Yeah, yeah. Ash, my father was like, you know, they... They did what they could and for everyone. He said only 32 parish. acres or something. About that, yeah. And he, yeah. Had, he gave a bit of land for... Ah, uh, yeah, sure. That was for the, the wood, like, for the... 
Because if, if you were, is, it, no, none at all. No, but it was bordering the the church yard and that there. You know, as a matter of fact, the where my sister and actually Paddy is in the same grave now, and my mum and dad and my grandparents on daddy's side, the where their grave is. You could say that they are actually buried in their own field. Oh, it is in that part of it. That's yeah. Kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a photograph now of the Cunningbeg boat, and um, it speaks for itself there, sure, with it. So many lives were lost on account of it, and they had been um, tor- they hadn't been torpedoed. That they had been chased a few months before that. Got away with it before that, but unfortunately, that was the time for that one. Then there's the other one. Picture is not as good. That's for the of the foreign bay. And again, there were so many, uh, there were some Sleeve Row people who uh, lost their lives on both of them. The Griffins and my grandfather on the Conning Bag, and there were Henneberries and Coke and um, that from Sleeve Row area on the Forum Bay. Then, as a result of that, in later time, we that's the letter that my grandmother got from King George from Buckingham Palace. Afterwards, something to have, nice as a memory to have. And that was a plaque that they got in honour of it again. Um, died for freedom and honour was what's on that one, the name there in the centre of it. I mean, a lot of war for people would have been involved in oh, the very First much, world. very much, yeah. yeah I mean, it was that's, an economic too, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's one of the picture of one of the medals now that he got. And that's the other one. Sorry. Sorry, that's the second one then. And where are those medals now? Do you have them? A relation of mine has them. Okay. Yeah. They're still in the family. Well, that's great. And uh, that was a photograph of my father, but that was on my grandfather in a different boat, the Lara. And that was him there on that. That was in my mum's writing. We're very lucky to have some photographs of him because an awful lot of people haven't the photographs. And there's the photograph of him. Possibly on his wedding day, it looks something like that. You know, he's very dressed up, fine looking man. Sad, sad day for us, but uh, nice to have it. And would you remember when you were uh, Annie Brophy? Oh, I do, yeah. Yeah, I remember, and he took several of our photographs. Yeah, yeah. And that is something now, a good treasure. It's uh, for the National Seamen's Sailors uh, Union book of his, which is lovely to have. That now, Waterford are after doing a good bit. First of all, there's some of the, the um, ones that were... These are at the Tower in London now, Tower Hill, London, in memory of, well, they would have been all the war people. And there's another one then to the glory. My Two of my daughters were there. And um, his name is on the, on some of it there for that. There, where the names are there inside in it. There are the two of them. Breda and Anne, and they're so proud of being there and seeing it. So there are more of this. You have one there of the monument in the key. Yeah, you know, the key. they're the actual ones, the way the names are drawn there on those, which is a wonderful thing for them to have. There's also a one, one gone, I haven't seen it, but some of the family have seen it gone up in honour of them. Their names are on the wall, I think, in Dungarvan. Oh, yes. Uh, but I haven't seen that one yet. Yes. And this is the one now that Waterford are after doing. The um, Conning Big, that's why the second one is not fully in it, because Conning Big we were more interested in. And that we had all given the money towards that one there some years ago for the monument. It was uh, Kilkenny Limestone. They were looking for an appeal of 5,000 at the time. 
and um, all my life, I should say, I'm going to the masses around the Armistice Day, the 11th of November. They were always remembered like for it, and it was the mass in Bally Bricken. And the, it used to be a big tea and water way back. It was the Poppy Day, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was around that time. But um, the one thing that just always very, very upset me and would still upset me now is at that mass, they would uh, troop the colours and uh, sound the last post and it is very very touching yeah very, you moving, know. Yes. Yeah, very moving for that good but yeah. you know you have your memories that actually was his wife my grandmother and there were two of the younger boys and note like how well as i was saying that she did so much for them the dress and all that of them that you could have them so dressed up for it was robert's uh confirm a communion obviously and jack then after that that's so well done you know there's more of the same there and that would oh, that be a pool for that? That one was obviously true, whatever uh, photographers were at the time. Because it is very set up. That one, oh it is, yeah, for it. There's just a couple of family photographs. There's one now, as I was saying to you, when we used, the, that was the background for our dairy and that was here in the yard in older times. And uh, that's my brother Paddy and myself in the Pony and Trap. So... Um, we were lucky to have that. That that would have been a very up to date one at the time. There, sure, we're looking lovely in it. Oh, it's no. very cute. Isn't it? Yeah. And I, was the house here attached? Yeah, it was over there at the far side of the yard, but it fell into disrepair, so we had to have it changed there some years ago. Okay. As I say now. And did you always have horses? Uh, we did up to when they gave up the farm and that you know we that we stayed living here then uh, when we got married and Paddy built his own house over at the road and we changed the house to um, more or less a granny you could call it mum and dad lived in the front of the house and we lived in the back and then we that's us now Joe and myself and our children that was taken about two years ago now um, just after Paddy died, it was our 50th anniversary, but we didn't have any thing for it, you know. Um, there's Paddy and myself. On the night of his 50th anniversary, 10 days before he died, in the best of form, we had to do in the Rue Glen over. And um, that was him, the best of form altogether that night. There's the actual one of himself and Maureen cutting the cake that night and to think of ten days after that he had. Right. Yeah. It was very sad all among, along, along the parish in general because uh, he was known so well for all the things, you know, being out there cleaning the street and all that. And just some more of our own family taken then. And he was obviously... obviously you know, not aware of the fact that he was getting old and the sense of he was up on the roof. Oh, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Sure, nobody else could do it, only him anyway. You know, uh, John myself on that night of Paddy's. That one is a bit off, Joe, is a bit cut out of it. Well, they're great. That's mm -hmm. a great guess. Mm. So sad he dies shortly after. Oh, that. just the ten days, and those are the girls of our. That's what we have to remember. Our fifty just to, uh, went down to our daughter Anne's house down in Balavarn that day, just to have some little thing for the children, and they're the girls of the grandchildren. So nice to have something anyway from it, you know, and that's um, just one we had there, the village pump and sleeve rail. As I said two years ago, when Father Brian Griffin was being ordained, it was a great clean up in the village, forward and Paddy was on the rounds, from one end of it to the other, and he was on the painting of the pump, and they had to put the black and amber on it, and that so. Um, as you would. Uh, as we would here, so there was a bit of banter going on about that at the time. So that's that one. That it's a funny one. That. Is that, that's that's. Uh, the place is, I suppose, we're, it's so connected to Waterford. Yes, oh, it is, yes, and, and yes, still it's, its own yes. identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's funny. 
So that's great. That's